When I was in fourth grade, I remember getting really excited when I watched a YouTube video about an explosion that occurs if you mix Mentos and soda. I really wanted to try this out at home, but my mom, quite understandably, wasn't too keen on an explosion happening in our apartment. So the next week, we went grocery shopping to Safeway, and I saw Mentos, and I saw soda, and when my mom wasn't looking, I combined blue Mentos and Diet Coke to witness a glorious explosion right in the middle of the grocery store. <laughs> Needless to say, I was grounded for two weeks. <laughs> but I've always been really interested in science and always curious about the world around me. Up there, you can see me quite fixated and staring fascinated at a butterfly. But when I was little, I always wanted telescopes and crystal growing kits for my birthdays. In middle school, my passion for science kind of became an obsession when I started doing research with algae. I started doing experiments in my garage, reading scientific papers, trying to figure out how pipettes worked, and learning as best as I could as a 12-year-old about the magical world of scientific research. Then in eighth grade, things changed. I went to India over the summer before starting my freshman year in high school, and I volunteered for a couple of weeks at a school near a village. Every day, I would walk past the village, and I would see people with scars on their faces and on their hands. These weren't normal scars. They were brown and green, and they didn't look like they had been caused from getting hurt. Naturally, I was curious about these scars, and so one day, I approached a woman and asked her about her scars. It was an embarrassing question, kind of like asking someone, why do you have pimples on your face? But I was dying to find out. She told me that she didn't know how she got her scars, and that most other people in the village had the exact same scars as well. I went home that day, I grabbed my laptop, and I searched those brown and green scars. And one result came up every single time. Arsenicosis, or arsenic poisoning. Eventually, I pieced together the pieces of the puzzle and realized that the well water in the village was contaminated with arsenic. Because the villagers were drinking this contaminated water, they were suffering from arsenic poisoning and cancer, thus resulting in the brown and green scars I had seen on their skin. I immediately felt a responsibility to help, to do something. But at the same time, I had more questions. I was curious, why was arsenic polluting the water, and why couldn't it just be removed? So I spilled my questions onto Google once again. Google's my best friend, by the way. And what I found was shocking. Millions of people worldwide are affected by arsenic-contaminated water. To be more specific, more than 137 million people in 70 countries are affected by this problem. This problem affects more than half the population of the country of Bangladesh alone. Just think about that for a minute. Then I looked at the current methods for removing arsenic from water, which I found all to be very complex and very expensive. I knew there had to be a better way, and I wanted to find a way to remove arsenic inexpensively from water. One of the techniques I had heard was called biomediation, which is using microbes to clean contaminated water. So I had an idea. What if I could create a new strain of bacteria that was safe, that was easy to grow and maintain, and that could help remove arsenic inexpensively from water? And that was the first time where I felt like I could really change the world. But at the same time, I didn't feel smart enough to do it. I was just a regular high schooler, not a prodigy. I, had, I doubted myself. But I wasn't just going to give up. So I consulted experts and scientific literature. I found that this idea had a very small chance of working. But I still wanted to do it. I was curious and a bit stubborn. <laughs> so I sent out 
nearly 100 emails to professors doing research related to microbiology and water research at universities near my area. I got 100 rejections. I was crushed and felt like my idea wasn't so great after all and that I should probably just give up. What was I thinking? I was a high schooler, not a genius or a prodigy, but I continued to reach out to labs near my area and eventually found one not far from my house. I contacted them, explained my project idea in an hour-long meeting, complete with an intense question session, and I walked out of that meeting with a new lab space. In the lab, I found an equally enthusiastic mentor who helped me become more proficient with using scientific equipment. I spent countless hours in the lab, often working late nights. I made mistakes. My curiosity pushed me on. My parents thought I was nuts. I rushed straight from school to the lab and back home all day. I spent my weekends and my breaks bent over PCR gels and restriction digest protocols. It was a risk, but I was curious to see if it would work and thirsted to make a difference in the lives of the people I had glimpsed into the summer after eighth grade. A couple of months later, I got the results of all the tests I was doing, and it had worked. It had created a new strain of bacteria that could be used to inexpensively remove arsenic from water. Right now, I'm doing further tests on this bacteria and also building a bioreactor kind of apparatus for this bacteria to be used with in developing countries. And through my journey, I found that science is really just a combination of three things. One, curiosity, asking questions, wonder about the world around you. And the question here is not why, the question is why not. Two, Creativity, thinking outside the box. How can you re-engineer or reimagine something that already exists, but in a better way? Three, risk-taking, taking risks. What I've learned is it's not really about being the smartest one in the room, and it's definitely not about being a genius, because I'm not one. It's about daring to think new ideas and following through with them, even if they don't work the first time, or in my case, even if they have a dismally small chance of working. It's really about perseverance, because that is the true mark of never, ever giving up. <laughs> That's where my stubborn streak actually helped, too. <laughs> I just would not let it go. <laughs> But it's just really about taking risks and taking the guidance from your teachers and from your mentors and following through with your ideas. I think by teaching these three ideas, this kind of an innovation toolkit, we can get rid of the many stereotypes that surround science and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Too many times when I was growing up, I heard people say, oh, I just can't do numbers, so I'm, I don't like math, or I'm just not good at science, so I don't want to do that when I grow up. But that is not what science is about. By opening up the field and teaching the importance of being curious and thinking outside the box and taking risks, we can really create an interest in science and in innovation in ways we have never imagined. And who knows, maybe it'll give rise to a whole new generation of grocery store experiments that go way beyond my Mentos and soda explosion. Thank you very much.